Welcome. Today we're focusing on a really critical decision point in medicine, picking the right vasoactive drug when someone's in shock. And the goal here isn't just reciting guidelines. We want to pull out the really practical need-to-know points, especially the major risks for clinicians right there on the front lines, you know, where every second counts. Exactly, because whether you're dealing with septic shock or maybe cardiogenic, even anaphylactic shock, getting that drug choice right and fast makes all the difference. It's about knowing why we choose one agent, and maybe more importantly, why we avoid another. Okay, good point. Let's start with probably the most common one we see, septic shock. So fluids are going in, but the pressure is still low. What's the definite first choice vasopressor? Uh, that's norepinephrine, no question really, it's the standard. And why norepinephrine specifically, what's it doing? Well, it primarily works through alpha adrenergic effects. So it's restoring that lost vascular tone, basically tightening up the blood vessels that have become leaky and dilated in sepsis. Norepinephrine boosts the blood pressure mainly through that vasoconstriction, but crucially, it doesn't usually crank up the heart rate too much. So you're getting the mean arterial pressure, the MAP, up without um, generally causing major issues with heart rhythm or massively increasing oxygen demand on the heart itself. That's a big deal when someone's already critically ill. Okay, and when we talk about getting the MAP up, what's that number we're shooting for, the target? The standard target, yeah, is to titrate the norepinephrine to keep that MAP at or above 65 millimeters of mercury for good organ perfusion. But is it always just 65? Like, set it and forget it? Or are there times you might aim a bit higher? Oh, absolutely. Good question. So 65 is the general target, but think about someone with uh, long-standing high blood pressure that hasn't been well controlled. Their body might be used to a higher pressure baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for them, you might actually need an MAP closer to 70, maybe even 75 to keep their organs happy. It's really about individualizing to ensure perfusion, but 65 is where you start. Got it. Now let's talk about an agent that used to be really common, but isn't first line anymore for sepsis. Dopamine. Yeah. Why the change? Why should we generally steer clear of it now? Right. Dopamine. Well, there are two big reasons it's fallen out of favor in septic shock. First, studies have shown it's linked to um, higher overall mortality compared to norepinephrine. free. OK, that's significant. It is. And second, and this is a really practical problem at the bedside, it carries a much higher risk of tachyarrhythmias, fast, irregular heartbeats, Dopamine just seems to irritate the heart more, especially at the doses needed for pressure support. So higher mortality, more arrhythmias. Pretty clear case against it. But just plain devil's advocate, is there any tiny niche left for dopamine in septic shock? Uh, it's a very, very narrow window. You might, might consider it only if the patient has a really low baseline risk for arrhythmias, and they happen to be relatively bradycardic-like. Their heart rate is unusually slow for someone in shock. Mm -hmm. The thinking there is maybe you could leverage its effect on heart rate, but honestly, it's a rare exception. Norepinephrine is almost always the better starting point. Right. That makes sense. So sticking with septic shock, let's say we started norepinephrine, fluids are optimized, but the pressure is still stubbornly low, refractory shock. What's the next step, mm. the preferred add-on agent? Okay, that's where vasopressin often comes in. It's the typical second-line agent to add to norepinephrine. And vasopressin works differently, right? Not a catecholamine like norepinephrine. Exactly. It works through a completely different pathway, V1 receptors, to cause vasoconstriction. So adding it can help get the MAP up to target without having to keep pushing the norepinephrine dose higher and higher, which can bring its own set of problems. It helps restore the body's sensitivity to the norepinephrine, too, Interesting. But vasopressin has its own specific watch out, doesn't it? A potential electrolyte issue. Yes, absolutely. Hyponatremia, low sodium levels. How does that happen? Vasopressin is essentially synthetic antidiuretic hormone, ADH. It acts on V2 receptors in the kidneys, telling them to hold on to free water. So if you give it to someone who's already fluid overloaded or maybe has underlying heart failure where sodium balance is tricky, it can dilute the sodium in their blood, causing or worsening hyponatremia. So if you see a low sodium on the labs before you start, or maybe a clear history of heart failure, you pause. You definitely pause and think hard. You really want to avoid it if the patient's already hyponatremic or at high risk. Worsening low sodium can cause serious problems like seizures, so it's a preventable complication we need to watch for. Okay, let's shift gears. Moving away from septic shock to cardiogenic shock. So the pump itself is the primary problem. The heart's not pumping effectively. If the cardiac output is low, but maybe the blood pressure isn't terrible yet, it's preserved. What's the go-to drug to help the heart muscles squeeze better? 
the preferred inotrope. In that specific situation, low output. Okay, pressure. Dobutamine is usually the first choice. Dobutamine. And how does it boost the heart's contraction? It's mainly a beta-1 receptor agonist, so it directly stimulates the heart muscle to contract more forcefully. That's the inotropy we need. This increases the stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped with each beat, and improves overall cardiac output and tissue perfusion. Does it affect blood pressure much? It can cause some vasodilation, a little bit of drop in pressure through beta-2 effects, but usually if the starting pressure is adequate, the benefit from increased cardiac output outweighs that mild effect. It helps the pump work better. Okay. Now, back to dopamine again, but in this cardiogenic shock context. Is there a situation here where dopamine is an absolute no-go? Yes, definitely. If the patient in cardiogenic shock already has arrhythmias or is clearly very prone to them, you absolutely avoid dopamine. Why? Even though it has some inotropic effects? Because it's just too arrhythmogenic. It increases the risk of making those heart rhythm problems worse, potentially triggering dangerous arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia. In an already unstable heart, that risk is just too high and can worsen outcomes. So the risk of cardiac instability pretty much rules it out if arrhythmias are present. Absolutely. The potential harm outweighs the potential benefit in that specific case. Got it. Let's talk about another presser. Phenylephrine. Pure alpha agonist, right? Just vasoconstriction. When is phenylephrine strictly contraindicated? What's the big danger zone? The big one is pre-existing bradycardia, a low heart rate. Okay, why is that such a problem with phenylephrine? Because phenylephrine causes intense vasoconstriction, right? It clamps down hard on the blood vessels everywhere. This rapidly drives up the systemic vascular resistance and therefore the blood pressure. And the body reacts to that sudden pressure spike. Well, exactly. You get a powerful baroreceptor reflex. The body senses the high pressure and tries to compensate by slowing down the heart rate. If the patient's heart rate is already slow to begin with, this reflex slowing can be dramatic, even dangerous. So you could tank their cardiac output. Precisely. You might fix the hypertension number briefly, but you could severely worsen overall cardiac output by dropping the heart rate too low. It's a critical physiological trap to avoid. Don't trade low pressure for severe bradycardia. That's a really clear explanation of a potential pitfall. Okay, one more shock type. Yeah. Anaphylaxis. Rapid onset multi-system involvement. Is there one clear winner here? Oh, yeah. Epinephrine. Hands down, first line, undisputed champion for anaphylaxis. Why epi specifically? What makes it so effective? It hits everything you need it to hit an anaphylaxis. Its alpha effects counteract the vasodilation and hypotension. Its beta-2 effects relax the airways, relieving bronchospasm and breathing difficulty. And it also helps stabilize mast cells, reducing further release of those inflammatory mediators. It's the complete package for this emergency. And given how fast anaphylaxis can progress, what's the key instruction about when to give it? Give it immediately. If you even suspect anaphylaxis based on the clinical picture hives, swelling, wheezing, sudden drop in pressure after an exposure, you give epinephrine right away. Don't wait for confirmation. Don't wait for labs. Time is absolutely critical. Delay can lead to airway closure or irreversible shock. Okay, that's super clear. This has been incredibly helpful, laying out the choices and the dangers. Let's try to quickly recap the, say, five absolute must-know pearls from this discussion for the listener. Sure. Okay, first, septic shock. Start norepinephrine early. Aim for that MAP of 65 millimillig or higher, but remember to consider individualizing that target, especially if they have chronic hypertension. Number two, dopamine. Be really wary. High risk of arrhythmias, potential for increased mortality and sepsis. Keep it for those very rare cases of bradycardia with low arrhythmia risk, if at all. 3. Vasopressin. Great adjunct for refractory septic shock helps spare norepinephrine dose, but always check sodium first and monitor it. Avoid if hyponatremia is present or likely, especially in heart failure. 4. Anaphylaxis equals epinephrine. Immediately. No delays if you suspect it. It treats airway, breathing, and circulation all at once. And 5. For cardiogenic shock with decent pressure but low output, think dolbutamine for anotropy, but avoid dopamine if there are arrhythmias. And remember, never use phenylephrine if the patient is bradycardic. Watch out for that reflex bradycardia. That's a fantastic summary. It really highlights how choosing the right agent, and maybe even more importantly, knowing when not to use an agent, is fundamental to good outcomes. Absolutely. Knowing to avoid phenylephrine in a slow heart rate or dopamine in an irritable heart. Those details are what make the difference when things are moving fast. Perfectly put. Okay, so here's a final thought for you, the listener, to take away as you face these situations. 
We talked a lot about the risks, especially tachyarrhythmias with agents like dopamine. How often should you be consciously reevaluating the risk benefit balance of any vasoactive agent you're using, particularly anything other than norepinephrine, even outside of septic shock? 